everyone, we all know that developers hate bugs, right? But there is something developers hate more than bugs, and that is slow development cycles that kind of make it difficult to quickly test out new features whenever we want to implement them, or to also bug these issues whenever they arise. And that can become a huge headache for a lot of developers, which is why today we're going to discuss how we can all say goodbye to this slow feedback loop and improve the overall developer experience. My name is Anita Ehuman, and I am a developer advocate at Metal Bear, where we're working on an awesome open source project called Mirror D that aims to improve the entire developer's um, experience. I like to call myself an open source fine girl, and that is because uh, most of my career started off with open source projects and in open source communities. I love advocating for inclusivity within tech communities and thanks to um, open source communities like Num Focus Disk and Sustain this Sustain OSS DI Working Group, I get to do some of this work. I am also the board of directors for Chaos, where we actively develop open source community health and analytics. When I'm not doing all of these, I am probably organizing local community um, meetups uh, with KCD Nigeria and also CNCF Abuja. So now that we have that out of the way, let us dig in. During this section, we are going to look at how we're going to first of all look at how um, a development workflow looks like in conventional development environments. Then we're going to look at the challenges with some of these approaches. And we're going to look at how we can actually rethink these approaches by moving on to remote to local development approach. And then we're going to look at how Miradi saves the day. And then finally, we'll look at a quick demo of how Miradi works in real time. So let's dive in. To begin with, I will to discuss something that we're all too familiar with, and that is the development workflow, right? Ideally, as developers, we actually want a swift process where we just have to write our code, test it out, it works fine, and then get pushed to GitHub and we'll move on with our lives. But that is not always the case. Because in situations where we're dealing with like cloud-based applications, you have to like take into consideration after writing your um, code base, you have to make sure that you build the application, it works perfectly, and then you move on to containerize it. After that, you go on to run it in the cluster, it works fine in the cluster, and then you now go on to make sure that it plays well with every other component that is involved within the application, and then finally deployment and even at that point, it also has to make sure that whatever changes that you implemented does not break the application in production. So this entire process can take up a huge amount of time, especially since you don't have to like spend a whole lot of time on the inner development loop, which has become longer than developers actually wanted it to be. And after that is done, you also have to wait to make sure that even if it is, even as it is in the outer development loop, the process is like closely aligned with the production environment and nothing goes wrong at that particular point in time. And I know so many persons might be saying it's not all that bad. A few minutes of waiting for that push wait circle, I can use it to scroll through TikTok, I can use it to pass time and then come back to it. It doesn't necessarily affect productivity or delivery, right? But when we're actually dealing with like microservice applications that now require like tens to hundreds of services, in this case, it gets trickier as now because you have to think about the more development loops that are involved, the more interactive services that are involved, the dependencies that go on between these services. You also have to think about the resources and then the complexities of these resources and so on and so forth, coupled with like multiple developers individually working on like these services. And so there's so much at play within like the microservice environment that things get out of um, control and suddenly you're not just writing your code anymore. You're not just writing your code anymore, right? You actually have to repeat this process over and over again um, across these services um, until uh, we see that there's actually no more errors. So imagine how much time gets involved at the end of the day. Imagine how much wait time actually gets involved at the end of the day. It can't, it turns this entire process that's supposed to be like short and swift 
to a more complex uh, maze that developers now have to deal with, introducing challenges like lengthy rebuilds and deployment processes where developers have to deal with long feedback loops, which eventually result in decreased productivity. You also have to handle like the suboptimal testing conditions. So I know so many persons are already saying, I can actually use mocks. It's not that much of a problem. But the thing with these mocks is it gives you like an implicit assumption of what the application would look like in a production state, which means it's not giving you exactly what the application would look like in production state. And at this particular point, there are likely going to be issues that are coming up in terms of compatibility, in terms of performance, in terms of security, vulner uh, vulnerability, and so many other issues that could come out that will uh, affect the application when it is pushed to production. Developers now have to like increasingly become dependent on DevOps teams as well, because in a typical traditional dev circle, you will see that there is like a centralized staging environment where every person can deploys every untested code to that particular environment. And because it is a centralized sp space, uh, whenever an issue arises in that particular space, the DevOps teams have to take charge and figure out how to fix the issues at that point, which also takes up additional time and that is a whole lot and um, a whole new ball game on its own and so many persons are already saying there are like local development environments that can be used to solve some of these problems yes there are there are like several solutions that organizations are actually opting for today that address this and the good thing with this local development environment is when you're using your local development environment you enjoy like the fast and the speed we like the iteration process. You don't have to wait several because immediately you're making your changes. You can actually see what it looks like locally and you can address any challenges that come up from that point in time. You get access to all of the local debugging tools that your developers are familiar with. So there's no much struggle with onboarding into new tools and all of that. Smooth and fine. However, every other process or every other tool that comes up, there are some and then challenges to it. Obviously, there's a clause. And some of these challenges that developers have to now deal with um, these local development tools um, or development environments is that you have to handle like the limited um, resources compared to the cloud environment. While it is very easy to get started with and is very local, it doesn't actually give you like entirety of what the application would look like in production, the resources that the application would need in production. And so there are also chances that you might not get exactly what the production state of the application would look like. Then you also have to deal with like high maintenance where your developers have to like constantly manage and update API scripts, mock data to ensure that everyone is on the page in the same page whenever they're working on a particular service in that particular in the application. And then they also have to deal with the system compatibility. Now, the thing with this local development environment is it always introduces the problem of it works on my system, but it doesn't work on Mr. A system or Mr. B system. And that is because some of the libraries and dependencies that I use often compatibility compatible with specific processor architecture and not compatible with others. And so this often leads to like runtime errors or slow down in application performance and so many other issues that come up along the way. And yes, I know so many other persons are probably saying that's not also a big deal. We have our remote development environment, right? Um, yes, we do. We have the remote development tools that are doing an awesome job. So many organizations have also opted for this dev environment as we're speaking. And it also comes with so many advantages, right? Because yes, while you're doing this, your team is going to uh, enjoy less workload on their systems because every single thing in this particular remote development environment is done remotely. And so you... You don't have to deal with the services or the database or the clusters because it all lives um, remotely and that makes the workload for your system a lot easier. Developers can easily handle any maintenance issues by moving the core of the workflow logic 
into a continuous integration and continuous um, delivery pipelines. And so everyone can just make a push to the code and then a set of procedures just completes the rest. So you don't have to deal with the differences in environment and all of that. Great, and works perfectly. But like the local development environment, it also has its claws. And some of these include like the long feedback loop because you actually have to like, when you're done with this, you have to, when you're working with the remote development environment, you have to, whenever you make a change, you have to continuize the application, push to registry, deploy to the cluster before seeing the effects of the changes. It's introduced like an additional time to like the development time like the development process as a whole. So we now have like long feedback loops, which eventually affect the engineering team's efforts. You also have to deal with frustrating debugging experience. Because imagine you're debugging an application and you actually have to go through all of these processes before you see the outcome of whatever changes you want to make. That is like an additional time spent within the application that was not actually um, calculated or planned for, making it a lot more stressful and then you also have to deal with the high cloud costs in setting up these environments because we have to set up development environment or like cloud environments for each developers. Depending on how many developers exist within an organization, you actually, you actually have to put into consideration the, dev, the environments for each um, developer involved and cater for all of that, which increases like the cloud costs. And at the end of the day, you're paying so much and then you're spending so much time, which is like a lot of issues that we're trying to avoid when adopting this in the first place. So at the end of the day, your developers actually need an environment that does not require so much from them and then take up in a huge chunk of their time. And at the end of the day, it closely or can closely mirror the production environment so that you're spending less time, you're saving more money, and then you're getting the best from your developers. And they're also giving you the best because they're not stressed with whatever dev environment you choose, right? That is where the remote to local development in comes as like a golden path. I often call this remote call because it's kind of a merge of remotes and then the local development. So like remote call. What or the magic that actually happens in remote call development environment is like it is a hybrid strategy, right? Where you take the best part of the local and merge it with the best part of the remote development environment. The magic that happens is you get the benefit of running your microservice, running the particular microservices that you actually want to work on locally, while every other thing gets to run remotely. You don't have to set up everything locally but you also get, but you are also not limited. You don't have to like work on everything locally, but you're not, not also limited to the, your computer resources, because at the end of the day, every other thing that your application needs or your app, every other thing about the application is accessible remotely, like your services, your database, all of the dependencies, literally everything is available remotely. It's just that specific microservice you're working on that you get access to on your local computer. You also don't get to deal with the downsides of an all remote or an all local workflow like we looked at earlier. Other benefits that your developers get to actually enjoy in a remote code environment is the consistency. You can actually code, you can actually code or test or debug in an environment that is closely aligned with the production state. So you don't have to deal with, oh, it, it looks good here, but like when you push to the production, it actually breaks something or it doesn't work like it's supposed to. Your developers have to uh, have the uh, benefit of enjoying the ease to use because they have access to like their favorite IDEs for tasks like debugging, authoring of code or running any unit tests, which makes it a lot more approachable for your developers and easy for them to actually get started with. They also have to, they have access to like the fast feedback loop because unlike the remote or the local where you actually have to wait for the CI CD, unlike the remote where you actually have to wait for the CI CD pipeline to be completed, you have to do the containerization, you have to also check in the cluster and so many others. We don't get to do that here because you're getting like the state of the, the application in the cloud while you're actually running everything locally. 
And so that actually makes the whole process a lot easier. You end up saving a lot of money because your developers can actually use a shared environment instead of like individual environments for each developers. So you pay less for like your cloud providers at the end of the day and spending a whole lot of money on cloud dev environments. And you're also like getting the best of both worlds, which is like an added perks, which is why a tool like MirrorD is or should be your go-to and saves the day. So if you're wondering how exactly or what exactly MirrorD is, don't worry, I'm going to answer all of that. MirrorD is simply an open source project that makes it possible for and very easy actually for developers to debug and also like test applications on Kubernetes. It comes as like a CLI tool and also an IDE plugin, right? And so when using MirrorD, your developers can actually run local processes in the context of their cloud environment. And with MirrorD, your developers get access to the cluster services as if they are running locally and then reroute the traffic to like the local, to like your local process. At the end of the day, it becomes very easy for you to test your code on a cloud environment without actually going through the drama of dockerization or CI CD or deployment. And you also don't have to like worry about disrupting the environment by deploying uh, untested code at any point in, in time. And how MirrorD works is like very simple. It comes with two main components. That's the MirrorD layer, which exists in the memory of a local process, right? And then the MirrorD agent, which actually exists as a pod in your cloud environment. So when you initiate MirrorD, the, it starts the MirrorD agent, which operates within the same network namespace as the particular pod that you're targeting in the remote environment. This agent has access to like literally everything your application will need in a cloud environment, like network and then the file system or database and all of that. So you can, using your local machine, you don't have to like deal with the heavy lifting of handling all of this because the MirrorD agent gets you access to all of that. And then the MirrorD agent on the, the MirrorD layer now, on the other hand, integrates into your local development environment, intercepts as well as redirects all um, low level functions to the MirrorD agent. So this allows it to interact with all of the resources, just like your application is running in a live code. So at the end of the day, you're wondering whether you're in the cloud or you're still testing your applications locally. Don't worry, we'll see it once I get started, but just know that at the end of the day, you're, you actually get to check out your code with real data and it's like working against real and actual production-like environment. And some other benefits that you get with MirrorD is it's not just about the name. It actually gives you like a mirrored state of like your cloud environment. And so when you're using MirrorD, it's like a bridge between your local and your cloud environments, right? So you can configure, configure exactly what exact, what functionality that you want to happen remotely and what you also want to happen locally. The sweet thing about using MirrorD is that it doesn't, you don't need the root access to actually use MirrorD. It is very easy to get started at, at the CLI or the IDE. You don't actually need root access to your local computer to get that started. MirrorD is not invasive as a remote cluster. It just um, attaches the MirrorD agent exists while that whole process is going on. And once it is, once you're done with the whole debug process and then you end that MirrorD agent also ends itself. You're going to see it as well. And so it takes a couple of seconds actually to get started up with MirrorD. It doesn't waste a lot of time and you can run multiple processes all at once and each connected to like different remote pods. So you're not even limited to just one task at a time. You can do a uh, multiple all at once. And MirrorD is also like very versatile. So it actually doesn't care which setup that your cluster has. If you're using a service mesh or you're using a VPN, whatever setup it is that you're using, MirrorD doesn't actually take all of that into consideration. It just works. 
And so at the end of the day, let's get started. All right, for this quick demo, I'm going to be using a very simple Python application to show you how MiroD works. So let's get into it. This is what my Python app looks like. The Basically what it does is it gives you like the weather update in like different cities that you enter. So whatever city you actually put in, going to like give you all of the prompts by calling an API that actually tells all of this. So I don't want it to answer this header anymore. to so probably change the button and I want to change this. So let's go into the actual code base for this. I want this to answer instead of today's weather app, I want it to answer an Anita's weather application. And I want it to say, tell me something. What is the weather? Let it just tell me something, right? And so that is in place. And if you notice, I have like my mirrordy.json file here. And what this file does is it actually has the configuration configurations that I need to tell mirrordy what I want it to do and how I want it to do it. So I've already set like the target, which the targets that I want it to use, which is like the weather de and the weather app deployment is, and um, imagine you're working on, on like a microservice where there are, like, there are multiple um, pods, you can actually specify a different target depending on what you're using, but I'm going to be specifying the weather um, app deployment. And I want it to also steal the um, traffic from this particular, from the actual remote cluster for me. So I wanted to steal on the traffic and my Mirrodi digestion file looks good. And my app PY file looks good. I'm going to go on and first of all, initiate Mirrodi at the bottom here and make sure that looks okay as well. And then hit the bug. This is going to take a few um, seconds, but you're going to see it running shortly. And what you're going to see at the end is Miradi starts to go through the whole process, right? It's going to create the Miradi agent, which is going to attach itself to like my remote cluster. And then the Miradi layer, which is available here, will redirect and also reroute the traffic. So let us see what that looks like. This has started. This is working fine. So let's see if um, anything changed. I'm not going to use, I'm not going to reload the actual page. I'll just open a new web browser and try to run this in. And so we can see that Anita's weather application now exists here. If you try to type in, tell me something, it gives you like the weather updates in Texas. If you try to try enter like a city in Nigeria, just you also get the updates there. So like. We are getting the feedback of what the application would have actually performed if it was in, if it was actually in production right now. And so if you also try this particular, if you try this URL now, this domain name now on your end, you also notice that these changes that I have made, even though I have not pushed it, you can actually see what the changes look like on your end as well. And how do I know that MiroD is actually working? I told you earlier that MiroD kind of injects itself into like your remote cluster. That's the MiroD agent, right? So let's see if the MiroD agent actually existed by doing Q get pods. And let's see. Now we see that there is actually a MiroD agent that is running uh, same, same as like the weather um, app deployment. So like they're both running at the same time, right? And now that actually tells you that this is actually how MiroD would work. Even if you're running in like a very large microservice application, you can indicate the particular microservice you want to work on, the, the target, the particular pod that you want to specify. And then MiroD will still do the same process that it's doing here. And at the end of the day, I am done. Let's say I'm actually done with um, this whole process and um, I'm done debugging my application. Now I want to stop this. If I stop this um, debugging process, you also see that the MiroD agent automatically terminates itself. Completed. And then, yep. So now we're back to like just the deployments that exist here running. And so, Basically, that is how Mirody works. 
You don't have to deal with all of the drama. And uh, once you're done with the changes, you can actually push to push your application. And then you're moving for forward from that point in time. Miradi takes like your feedback loop from what it used to be or what we actually looked at earlier to this. And once you code, you can actually test in your application in on staging using MiraD. So you're like seeing what your application will look like and you're making your changes. Once you're sure that everything looks good, you put your pull request and then your um, CI/CD um, processes and tests all go on from that point in time. And you also don't have to like panic at any point of your application breaking because already you're sure that you got like a very good state of like it's very closely aligned production state of the application while doing that with Meredy. So that's basically what I've been trying to explain since. So you spend less time with mocks and simulations. You get like immediate response of the cloud conditions of your applications and using Meredy you also get to, there are low chances of your application failing at like the later stages once you're done with all of this. That is all that we've been trying to say about Mirror D. Now we're done. If you have any questions at this point in time, I'll be more than happy to walk you through or go through these questions with you. And if you also want to find out more about Mirror, contribute to it or use Mirror D, you can actually check out MirrorD.dev. We have an excellent documentation that makes it easy for you to jump, jump on and get started with Mirror D. If you have any additional questions, we have an amazing Discord community with great contributors and also developers that are on standby 247 to actually assist you with any challenge at all you have using MirrorD. And you can also create any issues that you also come across using MirrorD at the end of the day. So that is all for my presentation. If you want to reach out to me, you can assess me at Anita e. Human on all of my social media platforms. Or you can also reach out to me via my email um, um, listed out here. So thank you so much and I hope you enjoy this.